When looking at Ed Kemper as a person and what he has done, Ed's crimes seem so unreal. It feels as if Ed is from a different planet. This is the story of Ed Kemper being released from a mental hospital at the age of 21 and just a few short years later he would be mutilating and sleeping with the heads of co-ed girls. In 1969, Ed would be released from essentially what was a mental hospital for the criminally insane and dangerous at the age of 21. He had served his time as a juvenile for murdering his grandparents. Doctors at the hospital would recommend that Ed not be released into the care of his mother because of the history and abuse and overall poisoned relationship. But against the doctor's wishes, he would join her again in Santa Cruz, California. Ed's mother would be in Santa Cruz where she lived after her third marriage. Now this is where the story starts in, where Ed would build upon his next few years living with his mother and slowly start into his life of evolving into a murderer. Ed's mother would take a job at the University of California. While there, and at this time, Ed would attend community college, but would eventually find one job that he loved and that was the Department of Transportation. You can even hear Ed talk about this in interviews, that he loved driving. And this would lead in to the start of how Ed would practice, fantasize, and let his impulse go. Now during this time, it's known that Ed would apply to be a state trooper. The problem with Ed was, Ed was a very tall man, 6'9", and weighing around 300 pounds. And his name around town, was Big Ed. It's well known and no secret that Ed would visit local taverns, places where cops would go and meet and have a beer after work. This is where Ed would get to know a lot of police officers around town. One would even give him handcuffs as a gift, jokingly. One of the most important parts of Ed, too, was his vehicle. Now, like most serial killers, Ed's car was his booby trap. It was his getaway. It was his bait. It was his number one weapon. Ed had a 1969 Ford Galaxy 500 with a black hardtop. The car was in bad shape, it was beat up, and had many miles because Ed would say himself he had at least picked up a thousand hitchhikers for about two years straight before he actually murdered someone. Ed would turn this car into a trap. He would have weapons hidden in the car and he would have it to where it suited him and what he needed. Ed would jam the passenger door to trap his victims inside. Once someone got in and sat down and shut the door, Ed would gently reach over and say, oh, your door's not properly shut. Let me do it for you. He would slip an object inside the door right into the locking mechanism, making the door impossible to open from the inside. Kemper would have two weapons in the vehicle, especially when he would murder someone. His 22 caliber automatic pistol under his seat while driving, then his 44 caliber Magnum, which he kept in the trunk of the car. You can almost say that Ed used the trunk of his car as a butcher block. It's where he would store bodies, transport them, and decapitate and chop up victims. There's one very crucial part of Ed's vehicle. When co-ed started to disappear from the university, police would tell students to only ride with vehicles that had parking permits and passes. But there was one giant problem with that scenario. As we know, Ed's mother worked at the university, so Ed had an A parking pass, which means he was allowed on the campus day or night. Now the day has come, it's May 7th, 1972. Ed Kemper would be doing his usual that day, picking up hitchhikers and driving them to their location. But this day is different. This is the day where Ed will pick up his first two co-ed victims, Mary and Anita. Ed did not choose his victims by stalking, by following, by a look, by anything. It was simply, these were the two women Ed would pick to murder first. Ed would be driving around Berkeley, California where he would pick up the two young women. The two young women would ask to be taken back to Stanford University. And it would seem at first, that's where they were going. The day that Ed would murder, he said he woke up that day with the urge, with the biting, gnawing power with this fantastic passion that he knew he was going to murder someone that day. Ed would drive around with the two women for quite some time, almost an hour he would say, before he finally reached a location that he was comfortable with, a very secluded, wooded area 
on a back road. At this point, the women are very confused, worried, and asking what is going on. He would stop the vehicle and place it in park. Pull out a weapon, Ed would tell the two young women that they would be assaulted. But really, this was a lie. Ed was just wanting to murder the women fast as possible. And this is why, when we go into detail, it's a very messy murder. It's not clean. It's almost something out of a Freddy Krueger movie. Mary would be sitting in the back seat of the vehicle. Ed would put handcuffs on her. And this is where something very awkward and very strange happened. Ed would say, I was really quite struck by her beauty and her personality. There was a reverence about her. There's something that happened that bothers me. I brushed against her chest, I think the back of my hand, when I was handcuffing her, and it embarrassed me. I even said, whoops, I'm sorry or something like that. As Ed was about to murder the two young women, he was embarrassed that his hand had went across her chest and touched her inappropriately. This is letting you into the mind of Kemper. Like I said, Ed's not thinking of taking advantage of the girls while they're alive. He's strictly thinking, I need them not to be alive so I can do what I want with them. And he's still at this point apologetic, and in some weird way, polite, for a split of a second. He would then leave Mary in the back seat. He would tell Anita to get out of the vehicle and put her in the trunk. As Anita was getting in the trunk of the car, she would say to Ed, Please don't do this. He would then take Mary out of the vehicle, walk her over to the woods, and place a bag over her head, trying to suffocate her. She would bite through the bag, and at this point would end up stabbing her to death. He would leave her there, walk up to the car, open the trunk. He would conceal his hands as he raised the trunk because his hands were covered in blood. Anita would say, what's happening with Mary? Ed would say, well, she got really smart with me. Ed would show Anita his hands. Anita would panic with seeing the blood on his hands. Ed said, Anita's lips would quiver at that moment. She was terrified and scared and crying. He told her he thought he had broken Mary's nose. At that point, Ed was trying to calm Anita down as she started to get out of the trunk of the vehicle willingly. But unexpectedly, Ed would grab a knife and start stabbing her. Anita realized what was happening. She threw herself in the back of the trunk, yelling, oh God. She began fighting back. At this point, this murder too is going very wrong. Ed was just trying to stab Anita anywhere, hitting her throat, her eye, her arms, and her torso. Ed would say he was amazed at how many times he had stabbed Anita, and she was still somewhat alive. He said Anita at this point was making noise and slightly had her hands up as she was still defending herself, even though Ed had stopped. When both women were deceased at this point, he would go back, grab Mary, and place her in the trunk with Anita. As Ed would shut the trunk of the car, he would immediately panic because he could not find the keys to his galaxy. He would say he thought he left them in the trunk with Anita, pacing around, falling over his weapon, and finding the keys in his back pocket. He would get himself back up he would then drive back home to his apartment with the girls in the trunk still. This is where the story would get even more gruesome as Ed had both the women in the trunk of his vehicle just committing not one but two random murders. He would return back to his home but unbelievably on his way back home he would be stopped by a police officer for a broken tail light. But the police officer would see nothing to alarm him that this man had two bodies in the trunk and that he had just murdered two women. When Ed had reached his home, Ed would take pictures of the bodies of the women before he took them apart and after he took them apart. Ed said he hoped these photos would last to where when he got the urge to do this again, he was hoping the photos would suppress that feeling. But he said the photos would only last two weeks before his urge was so intoxicating once again. Now the story would continue to get even messier. When Ed would reach his home with the bodies, he would take them in his apartment and start dismembering them. He would keep both the heads. Everything else, he would cut up and throw into garbage bags, which he would later take and bury in the woods. Ed would say when he was dismembering the women that he would have a thrill that this was the moment he had been waiting for. Ed said when he took the heads off the women, his favorite part about doing it was hearing the head dislocate from the body. It was a rush, he would say. Ed would spend that night with the heads, 
placing them on a chair and just looking at them until he went to bed. And when he went to bed, he would put the heads with him in his bed and sleep with them. Ed said that he had loved Mary and somewhat missed her, that he wished he had gotten to know her, talk to her, spend time with her. He said, I think personally deep down that I continue to do these things to try to get that out of my mind, to cover it up. Other young ladies trying to get them out. I had been very struck by Mary. I had never really taken a chance on getting to know her. I've had a lot of dreams about her. It's been very depressing for me. Ed would keep the heads for a few days before he took them and buried them in the woods, deep in the wilderness. At this point, Ed has just murdered two co-ed girls. They are being looked for and they are being talked about on the news. Ed has tasted blood and he will not stop. He will not be able to suppress this urge. It will honestly, as he says, get worse. Friends, thank you so much for listening. Until we talk about Ed again, remember, be careful who you take rides from. Take care, friends.